Another music in a different Another kitchen. Music, different different kitchen. Different what kitchen. What do you think of the joint? But when it's constructive and for the greater good, then I don't mind that at all. I was dancing when I was twelve. I was dancing when I was twelve. I was dancing when I was out. I was dancing when I was out. I danced myself right out the room. myself right at the womb Is it strange to dance so soon? I dance myself right at the womb This morning we have Paul from Darkness and Jive. Good to see you, Paul. Thanks, Trevor. Good to uh, be here. Great. If uh, we can take you back to before Darkness and Jive existed. Yep. Where were your origins uh, in musical terms? Well, I've always, all, and still am, a fan of music. I mean, I love, you know, that's that's the one thing I would say in my life that provides me with enormous amount of enjoyment, passion, energy, enthusiasm. Um, but I guess really, roots of it all, I was a big T-Rex fan. I love Mark Bolan, like Top of the Pops and all of that, really and still to this day, I would class myself as being a T-Rex fan. And um, I guess that moving through the early 70s, um, I guess probably the first time I can remember the punk stuff would have been around about summer of 1976, maybe early 76. Right. Um, and just reading about it. it was re Because at that time I would have been 13. You know, 76, I would have been 13 years old. Um, still at school, just pocket money and all that sort of you know, didn't have much money to spend on records or anything like that. Um, and then started reading about all these bands like the Ramones, but you, and Iggy Pop, Iggy mm -hmm. and the Stooges, uh, MC5 even, I think, Flaming Groovies, that you, you'd have in the yeah. kind of, you know, not punk really. Um, but that's the article that was kind of written at the time. And then um, first ever record that I bought that I think would have been the kind of the start of the that journey was the Ramones' first album again, 1976. Right. It must have been, I don't know, back in autumn time, so like a couple of months after just first reading about things. But I actually thought I walked down the stage in the windows in Newcastle, yeah, actually, windows. down in the base, basement where they had all the records on the ceilings and all mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I was walking down there and I just heard they used to play records and I heard this song. I actually thought it was Roxy music because it was a slow song with a kind of like voice. But actually what it was, was I Want to Be Your Girlfriend, off the Ramones' right. first album, because I had it up on the counter, what was playing, mm -hmm. and I put two and two together, Ramones, that's one of them new fangled punks kind of things, and I actually bought that album and loved it, absolutely loved it, you know, Blitzkrieg, Bob, Beat on the Brat, all of that, fantastic. Sweet little girl, I 
wanna be a boyfriend Do you love me then? What do you say? Do you love me then? What can I say? Because I wanna be a boyfriend It's quite ironic in a way because I, I guess up until that point, I'd been very close to one of my cousins who's, you know, a little bit older than me, so I had the benefit of his, um, you know, interest in music, so, you know, all the ball and stuff, and two older brothers, so I was kind of listening to Lou Reed's Transformer album when I was 10, you know, Neil Young uh, in the house as well, so I had that kind of education from I was going to say you had good knowledge yeah, of music. Yeah, older brothers and an older cousin, but when it came to the Ramones, that's where I parted company from everybody. They, what do you think it was? I think I think the what in the press again people would say a lack of musicality. You know, you got your there were other bands I guess around about that time, Leonard Skinner, mm -hmm. Freebird, all that kind of crap. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. which yeah. I absolutely hate. Yeah. I hate that American rock, and that was where like our Jared, like my cousin, kind of went down that route, um, and I veered off um, down the punk route. And um, I think it was because the bands, you know, good guitar solos, good guitar playing or whatever, that was seen to be like musicianship, prog rock, Genesis, yes, which I, again, who I absolutely hate, cannot stand. It really depresses me to listen to that music, whereas listening to the Ramones fills me full of joy and excitement yeah. and energy. Was and it, I think it was a very emotional response to the music. Was it something that felt like it was yours? It Very much of, so. of your generation, yeah, you know. Yeah, I think the kind of um, with me two older brothers who are quite a lot older than me, the ball and stuff was mine as well. I mean, they, they, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't consider themselves to have ever been a T Rex fan or anything. That was mine as well. But the other rock stuff, you know, um, as I say with with my cousin and stuff like that, it was very much the Ramones was a new thing. It was my thing, I guess. And and actually, I was the one I think who took that into school and. Introduce me friends to it, and you should mm -hmm. listen because you you know you go to somebody's yeah. house and just take your records in your plastic bag and you mm -hmm. play records in your mate's bedroom or whatever, yeah, and then they come to it. And that and I felt it was my kind of mission to yeah. kind of uh, you know bring this kind of new music. And again, um, not long after that, it was the Sex Pistols, obviously you kind of getting a lot of press. And I've still to this day got my Anarchy in the UK single on EMI, which I bought when I was thirteen. Which producer? Very, very proud of that, Chris Thomas. That's the one I've got as well. Yeah. Um, and the other one is who? Dave Goodman. Dave Goodman. Dave yeah. Goodman. That's the other one, isn't it? Yeah. I but, think that's um, rare, actually. Is it? I think so. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but I mean, again, that was a very important, significant um, moment. Um, you know, the, the press really kind of uh, going for the pistols in a big way, which just made you want to love yeah. them even more. Yeah. You, know, you just think this is fantastic. That rebelliousness yeah, of exactly. youth, isn't it? Yeah. And um, 
I know the, the Dam single came out first, didn't it? And mm-hmm. I think the first punk album, the British lot, was the Wire Pink Flag album, I think. I might, I might be wrong about that, but that's kind of what's in my head. Mm-hmm. Ramon's album was out, and then the first punk album that came out was Wire Pink Flag, which is another brilliant album. Yeah. All short songs. It was just such a different mm-hmm. feel. Everything was fast, it was energetic, mm-hmm. it was full of energy, it was rebellious. And um, so that, that just really hit a chord. And, like I don't know, like I think the wiring in my brain must have been fused because <laughs> at that time with that kind of uh, style of music. So, so that's a kind of as an early teen kind mm-hmm. of coming through all of that, um, and then going to see bands in the town, you know, in Newcastle. What was your first gig then? First gig, T Rex, Newcastle City Hall, twenty first of January, nineteen seventy four, <laughs> on the Zinc Alloy tour. I was I was eleven. I just I sort of turned eleven just a month beforehand. So I was very lucky. Because my auntie Kitty, who was forty odd at the time, took me and my cousin to see to see T Rex, and it was like, I mean, I know this might sound a daft thing to say, but it was more important than seeing God or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah. I mean? Mark Boland to me was just mm-hmm. supernatural, not a human being. Yeah. Because of the, you know, at that time, you know, you, had, you only had a few channels on the telly. Mm-hmm. Top of the pops, you couldn't get repeat shows of anything. So you, you yeah. saw something once, that was it. So the uniqueness, the preciousness of you know seeing somebody and actually seeing that person in the flesh on a stage with big lights and massive mm. band, big sound, it was it was just it was incredible. An experience. Yeah. yeah. who actually um, started the band with me and Docs and Jive are schoolmates, so we were all at school together. Um, so I, I'm trying to think through it, but we, I didn't leave school till 1981, so that's quite a long time from, you know, 76 with the Ramones mm-hmm. and the Pistols and everything like that, to leaving school, at, it's five, well it's maybe four and a half years later. So there's an awful lot of, it happened in the music mm-hmm. scene since then, so Docs and Jive were never a punk band, but we were a post-punk. Yeah, you were born kind of, out of it, really. Yeah, really. we were, and uh, but still that energy, um, the aggressiveness. There was a lot of that in the stage show. Certainly, we had a mixture of songs, um, but like the John Peel sessions that we did, you know, um, that was pretty much just like the the live set that we did at the time, just recorded, you know, um, with no very little overdubs. You might do a little bit of a backing track vocal, a mm-hmm. guitar bit here, but it was very much just that was us live, recorded live. And I'm very proud of that actually when you know you kinda of listen back to to those um recordings. I mean Steve and Toe on drums and bass are brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um and you don't think of that at the time, but then when you listen back to it compared to a lot of other stuff, you know, it was it was you know, it was good and, and I think we had a good reputation for being a good live band. Um but as I said, the gap between punk and us, there was a whole load of stuff that happened in between. You know, you got like I mean, the Human League and people like yeah. that were coming along, so it wasn't just your guitar music anymore, it was much more avant-garde stuff, and if I think about it, one of the earliest songs that really kind of made me think, bloody hell, that's totally different to anything I've ever heard before, was Frankie Teardrop by Suicide, mm-hmm. yeah. with a screaming at the end. <laughs> and if I have to be honest about it, even though I wouldn't have acknowledged this consciously, that must have had an impact on me because some of the early darkness and jive stuff, there's a lot of screaming yeah, in it. Yeah. I just think, well, where did I get that from? I didn't consciously, oh, I'm trying to copy Alan Vega or whatever, but I'd listen to that. Your influence was always coming exactly. somewhere along the line. I absolutely loved it, thought it was brilliant, thought it was 
totally, you know, off the wall, different to anything you'd ever hear. And I guess you kind of soak all of those influences up and it comes out somehow, somewhere, sometime, you know. Pointed at the six month old kid in the crib. Oh, Frankie. Frankie looked at his wife. the Ramones, the mm -hmm. Pistols, you know, people, and, and this idea that you could pick up guitar and play in a day, kind of, or not in a day, but you know, that was what was said. And the music did have this freshness and rawness about it, whereas a lot of the stuff in the late 70s and whatever, the rock bands, it was all very highly produced, which you could never do. Me, sitting in my, you know, bedroom or whatever in Wall's End, could never replicate that. Yeah. Whereas all of a sudden there was this whole new kind of young music where you thought, hey, I could have a go at that though. And it actually was a liberating kind of um, feeling that, well, why don't we have a go? And um, again, a couple of lads who I played with in, in what, I think the first, first time we played was in, we made Dave's garage. Um, it just, you know, there's a few of us got together in his garage mm -hmm. and played around, jammed around. Television, again, another brilliant band who were around at that time we went to see television at the City Hall with Blondie support and yeah. before Blondie were famous and all of that so that was around the time that we were kind of just dabbling um, but it, the band itself didn't really form until a couple of, year, couple of years later bedroom stuff fiddling about but it was when we met um, a lad called Steve Rainey from Belfast who um, you know you should maybe have a chat to him about the Belfast punk scene he was a couple of years older than us um, met him through a friend, and uh, just had a drink together, got on like a house on fire, liked the same kind of music, and Steve was a drummer, and that was the missing piece of jigsaw. So without Steve, I very much doubt that we would have even... It, it changed us from being a bedroom kind of group of pals having a little bit of a jam with the guitars into a proper band. Um, 
and that then went on from there. In what way? Which well, Steve of well, we didn't have a drum kit. I mean, this is another thing. Right. We, we didn't, you know, sorry, I'm so glad you'd get the violins out. So we, we came from a, you know, working class yeah. families in Wall's End. Not much Things money. weren't cheap then. Things weren't, exactly. You couldn't, you couldn't buy your instruments like, you know, it's, it's, kids seem to have brilliant gear and everything these days, but it wasn't like that back no. in the old days. We didn't even have a drum kit. Steve didn't have a drum kit. And we used to have to rehearse at um, uh, Desert Sound Studios over in Felon. Steve Oliver from Zap and Bobby, Bobby Greenwood maybe, um, and they were great, brilliant. And we used to hire the kit and rehearse over there. Um, played a few gigs with them. Um, first gig ever was with Secret Sex. Phil George was a really good artist. Um, they came from the ashes of the Condemned. Did they? Yeah. Like oh, Vic, did you know Vic and um, Savile. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can remember the condemned, yeah. I from think the yeah, I remember the name. I don't think I've ever seen. There was a it. single came out, a split single with the pros right. on the Rock yeah. Against Racism label. Right, right. No. No, I, I didn't realise that. No, because there was two brothers, wasn't there? There was Fag and Vic, I think. I remember it? Vic. Yeah, Vic was a guitar player. Right. Fag was the drummer and bass player. Um, I think, and Phil, who was still a mate of mine now, it was at the Mater and Benwell. Um, we supported them and it was just it was just great it was just really good you know a really good buzz played at the Newton Park Hotel down in kind of I don't know where that is it's kind of not Walker it's not Newcastle it's a heaton type of area mm -hmm. you know um, what was then, your style at this point was it anything like what we would associate with Darkness and Joy? Uh, yeah I mean Rage in a Cage Death in Venice those are songs which are on the um, John Peel Sessions uh, album those songs were written very early on, and, and by that time, uh, I would have been 19. So you kind of, you know, a year after leaving school, um, 19, Candle. Um, but Candle, which is on the album that were produced later, a few years later, is very kind of um, almost orchestrated with grand mm -hmm. piano and everything. But when we first recorded it, it was very heavy synth and very heavy drums. <laughs>
So, like, you had a few songs like that from from virtually day one in the set, um, and with hindsight, I guess you know, "Rage in a Cage" was always probably the best song that we did. We should have probably released that as a single, mm -hmm. but we didn't. 
And I think that might have helped establish a stronger identity for us because that's what we were like live, whereas the first single we released on the Red Rhino label was Hooked On You, which was a much, much gentler, poppier kind of song. I mean, I was, I was going to ask you that. Um, it really surprised me after the Peel sessions and how, in some shapes, pretty angry, you know, yeah, pretty yeah. energetic. And then when it came to releasing the first single, yeah, it's just the opposites. Yeah, you're right, absolutely you know, right. And where did that decision come from? I don't think that... Um, I don't think that helped us. I th the reason why that, sing that record was chosen, that song was chosen, because I think that's what the record company wanted. Um, just to go back a step, I think we were, by this time we were playing quite a lot of gigs um, all around this area, played down in Teesside and, and you know, Saltburn and everything like that, and all around Newcastle. Um, and we played the Beer Keller. You remember the yeah, Beer Keller yeah. in Waterloo Street? Which is a great change its name so many Dingles, times. the beer keller, Zoots, Z yeah. Uh, so all the same place mm -hmm. underneath the, the club that well the cinema which became a club which was rock shops That's at one right. time. And there's a band called Off. Um, again, nice bunch of bunch of lads and, and Wendy, I think the singer's name was. Um, you know, they we played with them. I think they might have been supporting us. And I think the guy Kelvin, who was the drummer in Delta Five, right. he was the kind of talent scout for Red Rhino. Came up to see, I think it was off who came up to see, um, or maybe one of the other bands who was playing, and he loved us. Just one of those lucky breaks. He, he, th I remember him saying, he says, "I've seen the future of rock and roll," which, no. which obviously is a bit of a um, daft thing to say with hindsight looking back. But I think at the time, Darkness and Jive gigs were quite, you know, very very powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a very powerful stage presence. There was a lot of screaming going on on stage at various times you might absolutely hate it um, but that's what we were like you know that's what we did and obviously Kelvin thought that was good paid for us to go down to um, some remote studio in Heckmondwike in Yorkshire um, and did a demo um, we did a demo of I think five or six songs and Hooked on You was one of them um, and that was the one that the guy who owned the record company, Tony, Tony K from Red Rhino, I think he liked that and we did that as a...
to Spacewood Studios in Cambridge. Um, yeah, that's a pretty popular studio. Yeah, there's a lot of people recorded there. And that, and that was that was, that was was a bit of like a taste of luxury. I think we were there for a couple of days, so you kind of slept overnight for a couple of nights. Um, it was like just great fun. You know, again, just traveling down in the back of a van, um, just, you know, recorded the songs. Um, I don't think though, I don't think those songs are very well produced. We did Guys and Dolls on the first John Peel session, um, and then we did it as a single, and I think the John Peel version is much better. Right. It's much raunchier, mm-hmm. it's a heavier guitar sound. For some reason, the the production on the, the Space World single is just very thin and very tinny. I mean, Furnace is a brilliant live song, and it just has no power on the record. So that's what I mean about you know Darkness and Jar being a really good live band. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I think that we just didn't transfer that energy onto the record. Um, we were inexperienced. Um, I think we didn't have a, a relationship with a producer, mm-hmm. which I think we would have benefited from if somebody had worked with us over a period of time. Um, but that single, it's, it's interesting really because um, we did get into the indie charts, you know, which I'm quite proud of. You know, I think and the John Peel sessions, um, if you have a look on the inside, it's just the HMV charts from Newcastle. Yeah. I think we're in the charts with Michael Jackson and Wham <laughs> and stuff like that. We can't take which, that away from you. Which is hilarious, really. But it, it, it does make me laugh uh-huh. because it was we are completely coming from, you know, I'm holding my hands out here, but like one end of the spectrum mm-hmm. and then there was this other load of pop stuff and, you know, uh, and you kind of in the same list of, as people That's like it. That. For a time you were, you were there. You yeah. were where you wanted to be. Yeah, absolutely. You were in a band. You were playing the music you wanted to play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and you know, th- and we did, and you know, then um, Red Rain. I think the singles didn't sell. And I'll be absolutely totally honest about that. We, we must have sold a few hundred copies, maybe of a run of, uh, well, maybe a bit more, um, out of a run of a couple of thousand. And that was, and no, you couldn't afford to produce your own records mm-hmm. in those days, so you have to have a record company. Who was responsible for the promotion? Did Red Rhino or not? Red Rhino, Pinnacle, Very Distribution. I don't, I don't think so, I don't, I don't think we got, we had a couple of players on, I'd say it was quite helpful locally, it was Ian Penman, I think Ian Penman had seen us and quite liked us and I think he might have played you know, records on Radio Newcastle right. and stuff like that. We did, you know, kind of local radio, metro radio, um, we had the John Peel sessions, but what we lacked was we, we didn't do a tour, you know, and that was and that was because I was the only one in the first band who was full time. The rest of them had jobs, so really? that was part of the problem. Right. That was part of the problem why the first band we couldn't get to the next level because they just wouldn't leave work, couldn't get go full time. You say wouldn't, couldn't, mm. and and that that was a real thing. So there was me. Who wrote all the songs? Who was full time? Didn't have a job. Was on the door, and the lads in the band who all had jobs, and and I think I think that again with hindsight, you need to be a hundred percent committed. Everybody does, and I think you know there are obvious reasons why we didn't, you know, make it in mm-hmm. inverted commas, but I like to still think that at least we stayed true to ourselves, and even when we got you know the next kind of single that came out after the John Peel sessions, which was with. Float and World, which is Impulse Studios, um, you know that was a, a really good record. I'm very proud of those songs as well. I mean, Victims is a really hard hitting track yes. about domestic violence. Because mm-hmm. I don't know, I mean, and that's not an indication of anything in my personal life. That was inspired actually by I don't know if you remember on the Lodger album. What's this song called? The Bowie album? Is it Repetition or something like that? Or 
Johnny is a man who's bigger than you, and it's about domestic right. violence. But it's so understated, mm-hmm. and I thought... Probably why I missed it. You know what I mean? It's, it, it's like the bruises don't show. I thought, if you're going to write a song about domestic violence, then let's get out there, get it in your face, because mm-hmm. it's a horrible, terrible thing. You know, it really destroys people's lives, and that's why I wrote Victims, to actually, you know, just say, right, this is how I would kind of try to get that issue in front of people.
thing, sorry I'm going to digress here a little bit, the name Darkness and Jive was always designed to be an indication of what the music and the lyrics were about because, it, you know, have you ever seen that film um, Blue Velvet by David yeah. Lynch and it's got the beautiful picturesque um, suburban kind of, um, you know, house and the, the, the you know, um, streets and neighbourhood and then, then the camera pans in and you see the kind of insects and it's, and it's all kind of death and decay. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of that kind of opposites, darkness with jive. So I wanted yeah. the, the music to be lively, energetic, but with a with a kind of undermining, kind of subversive yeah. lyrical content. 
and actually hooked on you is about Joyce McKinney. I don't know whether you can remember Joyce McKinney, who the Mormon sex slave yes, scandal. Yes, yes. I've seen pictures of your room, and I want to be a prisoner for a week or right. two. It's about she she drugged this guy, had him chained to the bed. People didn't get it. No. You know what I mean? People didn't get the fact that that song, even though it was a, it sounded like a nice pop song, but the lyric was really dark mm -hmm. and really quite subversive. But you see, I never got the chance to be interviewed yeah. to explain <laughs> stuff like that. So I say, well, 30, hopefully, 30 years later... Hopefully people will go back and listen well, to that. Maybe. With maybe. different ears, you know. Yeah. And, the, and the other one, uh, Tarzan on the other side, is coming to my jungle and hold me like Tarzan, which was a bit homoerotic at the time, mm. but actually Carl Jung, who, you know, this kind of dream therapy and all, all that yeah. kind of stuff. So the lyrics to me were really, really important, and I don't think people got it. I no. think it was just one of those things, people hear things very superficially that don't delve into anything because you haven't got time. There's, there's better riffs out there, there's better beats out there, there's better tunes out there, so why spend the time on this couple of tracks on mm. this... You know, I mean, normally you would bands. explain that through music papers. Did you not have many interviews? We didn't. We were I mean, I think you know, we were chatting before, and Darkness and Jive really was a group of lads from school who just got together with with a you know Belfast chap, um, and we just did it all ourselves. We didn't really have any uh, management, not properly. We had a mate who was a manager. In fact, it was all friends together. Mm -hmm. We used to actually pool our money, so you'd put like a bit of you know, kind of pot money or your dole money into a kind of account and that that paid for strings, drumsticks, hiring a drum kit because we still hadn't, didn't have a drum kit at this point. So we recorded the John Peel sessions, we didn't own a drum kit. Yes. You know, all, all of that, the records, we didn't own a drum kit. So um, you kind of had to just get by and we, it's amazing that we got as far as we did. And we, uh, you know, go to the, I suppose, under the John Peel side of things, we literally went down to London to get, um, signatures for a petition it, for a venue to be opened in Newcastle so it was me and Keith and um, Nigel who's a really good mate on the overnight bus from Newcastle down to London to Victoria and we literally sat outside the um, studios, studios um, in, in London and waited for people to go in I think we got Bruno Brooks's autograph <laughs> Kid Jensen's um, George Martin's actually. George Martin. It, it was really weird. This guy really? comes up in a suit, you know, really well to do looking fella. And um we're, and us three scallywags from the northeast of it, would you like would you mind signing our petition? And he stopped and he said, Do you know who I am? I said, Yeah, you're George Martin, Beatles, you know, and he seemed to be really kind of pleased that we actually knew who he was because he didn't look like a he obviously didn't look like a pop star, he looked like mm. a bank manager. Mm. Um, so he signed it. And then John Peel and um John Peel took some time to ask us who we were, what we were doing. Um, he, he thought it was great, signed the petition. I gave him a demo tape that we recorded at um, Desert Sound Studios, which had Rage in a Cage on, and Death in Venice, something like that. A four track studio. And um, he invited us onto the show, took us for a paint. Hey, mister, tell me how you're such a big hit with the girls. Well, it's like this, honey, it's like this.
John Peel, yep. in your opinion, everything right? Yep. Was he a genuine bloke, genuinely yep. interested in what you were doing? To me he was, because you, you, it was like a dream come true, that, I mean, you know, it's, it's like something from a, from a book, you know, a band goes down from Newcastle, I mean, again, it would have been about 19 at the time, with a four-track demo tape that recorded above a derelict bike shop in Felham, gave him that, and, and he was lovely, he was really lovely. Genuinely, I'm not just saying it. I don't know. You don't know what people are like, but mm, you know. Like but his contribution, I think, to to British music is unparalleled. You know, you think all the all the acts that he's championed, all the chances he's given to people who yeah. have never got any airplay ever. I mean, we wouldn't. We wouldn't have done. Um, took us to the pub, had a drink, took us onto the show. Um, so I had a, had a chat with him on the show about who we were and all that kind of. He was just brilliant. And then um, we were. Uh, away in a caravan up in Berwick on holiday and a, one of my mates, I was just ringing home to see how things were, one of my mates said, you've got to get in touch with John Peel, he's been on the radio saying he wants Darkness and Jive to give him because he wants to give you a session and it was, and that was it. What so we, had, we hadn't even left an address with him, I don't think, we just kind of gave him the tape. So we didn't have any plan, we didn't have any management behind us yeah. saying this is what you do, this is the, you know, the strategy that you should have to get a record deal. We, we didn't know what we were doing, we were just a bunch of kids trying to make some music and um, and he um, was good enough to give us a chance um, you know put us into the we got we got went to the Maida Vale studios in London recorded the first session um, can you explain the process of going to Maida Vale was it was John Peel did he have any he involvement wasn't there. in that no. he, wasn't, he wasn't there at all no we John, John Walters would he have been there see you producer John Walters um, he produced John Peel's show but the person if I'm right. it's a long time ago Roger Pusey I think is the the name that's just sprang into my head there right. so anyway we went to the Mainerville studios hired a van all the way down to London um, and just it just booled up and just they took you in it was all very you know well to do and mm -hmm. I mean great great place you know and fantastic it literally a dream come true for me and then for for the lads in the band um, to, to be there in the studio recording some songs for, for the John Peel show. Um, and if I, again, and Roger Pusey, who was the producer, took us across the street, I think, to like behind some houses, where was a bloody tennis club. So it was all very la di da, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it just, it was a different world, completely different world. Then that, that got played, um, I think we were playing down in York. Um, so you never heard it when it first broadcast? Uh, we had a gig that night, I think. Because um, so that would have been as much of a buzz yeah, as doing we, it. No, we, I think we were playing at the York Arts Centre with um, 1919. Right. They, they, they were another um, band signed to Red Rhino and um, a poet called Nod. I don't know if you can remember him. Not From Newcastle? He, he did a great poem called Daz or something like that. Daz washes whiter than white. And we played a few gigs with him, actually. Uh, through the Red Rhino connection, um, and I, 
we got a second session. Um, I can't remember exactly how that came about. I remember thinking, I haven't got enough songs. We haven't got, we haven't got enough good songs. And I actually wrote Jigsaw and Victims because we did to, for the John Peel session because I needed some something, some material which was a bit more substantial. You know what I mean? And I think, and that they they eventually became a single which was released on um, Floating World Records, which is kind of based at Impulse Studios, um, Wars End, which is now demolished. You know, kind of all the whole. The f- fabric of the northeast yeah, kind of that's music. got a history in it's, itself. Yeah, Mayfair has gone and all of that mm-hmm. stuff, you know. I'm in pieces 
Second session was great, great fun to do that as well. Um, John Peel actually gave me his home phone number and I'm sure, and I'm not just saying this, I genuinely believe this, if I'd been a different person and had rang him up, I'm sure we could have had more sessions out of him. Yeah. But, I, you know, it, it got to a point where when the band, so the band went through a number of different um, kind of uh, lineups, and was I'm kind of jumping ahead a bit here. Was it the same, sorry, no, was sorry. it the, the same lineup for the two sessions? It was, just... except for the synth. Um, Gary, who was on the first session, I mean, Gary had this brilliant um, monophonic Korg MS-10 synth and it used to play these great sounds but it was only literally one finger you know, so he couldn't play like a piano it was literally just one finger would produce this sound and um, and then he left the band for a little while um, and we got this other fella in Tony Strong who actually had a polyphonic synth so he could actually play, play like more than one note at the same time and tragically Tony um, Tony died Tony, I think it might have been of a brain hemorrhage right. um, quite young after he after he left the band again, by the way, so and then Gary kind of came back in. Um, so that was Tony must have only been in his mid twenties, which was you know again very very sad um, sort of situation. Um, but just out of the blue, completely out of the blue. Um, and but I, I, it's just I'm imagining two John Peel sessions. Mm -hmm. The feedback must have been massive. Well, uh, Feedback, um, interest from record companies. Not really. I mean, we had um, we had Kelvin came to see us at Red Rhino. So I suppose at that time we were kind of signed to Red Rhino just to do a couple of singles. We did. Uh, well, yes. Yeah, was sorry, that a consequence that's... of the sessions? Do you think? No, that was a consequence of him seeing us play live. I think we were always a much better live band than we've ever been able to capture on record. I think. Um, I think that you know people who'd seen us back in back in those early days, it was it was, we were a good live band. Mm -hmm. You know, some people are much better on record than they are live. I think we were much better live than we were on record. Um, the we did have we had a few kind of uh, unlucky breaks as well. If you could say that because we had um, Keith Chegwin's brother and Keith Chegwin's a twin, and his brother came up to see us from RCA Records, and. Um, this was the kind of second incarnation of the band, by the way, so we're kind of jumping ahead again. Um, paid for us to do some demos. We were supposed to go down to London to do some more, and he ended up going into a clinic because he was an alcoholic. So, um, sorry, I don't know whether I should say that. That's what I think. I yeah. careful in case of slander somebody. Um, but um, that that is what I understood had happened. He wasn't well, um, so that, you know, he, he, he had to take time off work. He, he'd been to see us up at the Buddle Art Centre in Wall's End and um, thought we were great. But the timing just was, you know, again, one of those things. I mean, you could kind of do your head in going through the things that might have been. Yeah. And, um, you know, for a while, uh, when it all kind of stopped, and again, I don't kind of jump in ahead, um, I was a bit bitter and twisted for a while. Because, you, you know, you put so much of your life and your hopes and your dreams and your ambitions into this thing. And... Um, and it doesn't work out the way you want it to and you know because the music industry being such a tough vicious kind of world um, mm. but that's that was much later on actually a few years later when the band was doing really well playing loads of really good gigs had a great live set we signed the Jet Records um, Don Arden who was like a, one of those well-known rock and roll impresario characters you know very very famous very well known in the industry and a very tough character um, and it kind of all imploded as a result of that I think that was the biggest mistake that we did we should have stayed independent we should have done our own thing we shouldn't have signed to the major label Burning in my fireplace I wait 
told what to do at that point well I don't I, I wouldn't say told what to do but I don't think they knew what to do with us when they'd got us mm -hmm. I think that was the thing because um, we did record an album which never got released it was never really properly finished um, but we I did manage to get the tapes off um, Dave Woods at um, Impulse I mean Dave's a really nice guy um, very down to earth we recorded the album there and it was then taken up by Jet, bought by Jet Records and Jet Records, a yellow, you know, kind of, Don Arden used to be um, the Moves manager, um, Roy Wood, all mm. that kind of I stuff. I remember the label more than anything. Yeah, well, exactly. Bright yellow That's the one, with yeah. some blue in there. Yeah, well, we never got anything released on that label, um, but we signed a contract with them um, and the album that we did, which didn't get released, the reason why I didn't get released is because Don Arden didn't pay Dave Woods for the recording fees. So there was a court case and that went on for years and I was stuck in the middle. So I couldn't record. My, my contract was... You, you were um, tied to that contract. Yeah. Is that the right thing to and say? I, yeah. For a, yeah. I mean, so I you couldn't go on and record for anybody else? I couldn't. I, what I should have done is I should have, you know gone to see a, you know, a lawyer, I guess, and got, got it all sorted and got damages. But again, I was still quite a young, maybe too naive, trusting person. I think it's not sort of complete wuss. But um, you, don't, you just don't know how to mm. deal with those situations in those circles. Because you've got like these companies, you know, these people who've got the lawyers and the accountants and the management. And now I'm just, a, at that time, just... A kind of kid from Wall's End yeah. who by this time um, has two children right. you know so we had um, Jack who was uh, Jackie Dolly as I should give her a, a proper title from the darkness and Jack, you know, Jack and I got married and we're still together I'm pleased to see we've got three lovely daughters and you know two lovely grandsons so all of that side of life has been brilliant but it might not have been if things had worked out with yeah. the band you know what I mean so you've got to look at your life I think in the round um but there was a time with the jet stuff when it all kind of imploded that I was very bitter and twisted for a while. But they were, they were I hesitate to say these things on in, in a recorded kind of format, but they were a strange company, let's put it that way. I used to get money delivered every week by the postwoman. They wouldn't pay money into the bank. <laughs> it was cash in an envelope. Quite sinister, this, isn't it? Well, it, it was, and they didn't want, uh, initially, they didn't want to sign the band. They just wanted me because I used to write all the songs and I refused. I said, no, you know, we're, we're mates. I'm not signing to you unless we, you, you take the whole package. So it was the band. And what we ended up doing was, I don't know if you can remember that Enterprise Allowance scheme where mm -hmm. you used to get a 50 quid a week. Yeah. Well, that's what we did. Darkness and Jive was a band that was allowed to, or was managed to exist because of the Enterprise Allowance scheme. 50 quid a week, which um, all of us got, you know, as a, we kind of set ourselves up as a, almost like a business um, and that was good because we got that money as a, a kind of platform and then I would get some extra money from from Jet which which you know um, allowed us to continue for a, a couple of years I think but the Jet thing was a disaster I have to be honest about it with hindsight. Alive. 
I can feel your claws tear deep into my soul. Free my heart and let me go. Shake down, steal your bleeding body. Shake down, keep yourself alive. Shake down, he's after your money. Twitch with a kick and flick me with your knife. At the time where you're still gigging profusely, was stuff going yeah, on weekly? One of the things I regret was that we didn't tour. We never toured, but that was because we didn't have the contacts. Mm -hmm. You know, we again, if we'd had a decent manager, everybody in the music industry wants a piece of you for doing nothing. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like. It's a grand statement to say, a bit, a bit of a sweeping statement. But my experience is there are a lot of people out there who will say that they will help you, um, but they do bugger all, mm -hmm. and they want the cut of whatever it is you make. I mean, we made no money. We made absolutely nothing. Was that ever yeah. on your mind at the time, or were you just wanting to make the music? Oh, it was, it, it was just the music. Oh, I just wanted the music. the music, yeah. I mean, it, never it, the money side of it never never bothered me at all. However, when it got to the point where the jet, you know, the, that, the postwoman <laughs> knocking on the door, sometimes the knock on the door didn't come. So literally, you, know, you kind of... Waiting for it, for it, and so that meant you a week without any money, and mm -hmm. that's another that's not a nice place no. to be. So they, it did it did get to a point when this court thing happened between you know um, Impulse and um, Jet Records. I couldn't record for anybody else really at that time, and I just got fed up. I just thought I'm not putting my family through this just because I want to do this. I want to write music. I want to write songs. I want to you know I, I, I put the family first. Um, and that was that was really what what made me go down a different path. I didn't do anything musically for quite a while because I was bitter and twisted about the whole jet thing.
tries to make her understand Words are not enough to hold them Together for forever and She just wants to kiss and hold them He hopes they can still be friends She cries at the pain Maybe an interesting aside here is Derek Wormsley, who played in the band for quite a while, Decker. He's actually a really well-known actor now. He's playing the dad in Billy Elliot um, in the West End in London. Um, and he, um, Decker won a, an Olivia Award for he, so he's, he, and he's still a good mate, you mm -hmm. know. So he, he's gone on to do bigger and better things mm -hmm. through acting, um, which is obviously the right thing. But Decker left the band to go down to London to drama school, so we had to get another. So there was a, a kind of change of lineup for various reasons yeah. over the years. Um, well, it's like you've explained, I mean, you were the force behind the band. Oh, yeah. The, the, the people came and went. Yeah, the, the songs are usually music and lyrics Paul Johnston, mm -hmm. Gary McKenzie who is a really close mate is, is a, also a really great songwriter um, but at that time a lot of Gary's stuff would have been, we, I mean Seduction which is on the album, um, that's Gary's tune you know like African Dream there's a bit of stuff like that or what kind of um, Spirit is Waiting it's called on the album, some of that was contributed so there was some stuff ironically Gary and I were working together much more closely on more kind of collaborative stuff in a project which we call Poison Pop um, after Darkness and Jive, which never really saw the light of day. So we were kind of starting to work more closely together. Gary contributing more stuff musically, me still doing most of the lyrics. But Darkness and Jive was very much, you know, 90% me, I'll say. Arrangements, absolutely the band. I mean, yeah. you know, they would do their own thing, bass and drums and that kind of thing. but but the ideas for the songs tended to come from me. I mean, at this point, you were having television appearances as well. I remember the Tube, Tips yes. 45. Yeah. There, was a, there was a little period when um, we did have a bit of uh, assistance, like help from a kind of management company. But again, it was Tim Bullymont and um, Terry McClelland. And Terry was, you remind me a bit of Terry, actually. You look a bit like <laughs> me. So. Same kind of hairstyle. And Terry was... A really good laugh. He was, a, he was a and Tim was a bit more serious. And Tim actually worked as a um, kind of researcher on the tube. So it was a classic example. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, and we benefited from it that time. You know, a lot of the time when we didn't benefit from it in terms of record companies or tour, all you know, that kind of contact, we were lucky to have somebody who was who thought we were great, who was part of, you know, and wanted to help us, who actually could help us in that way. So the, we did do the tube at Riverside. Um, and sorry, when I, going back to that story, I was telling you about the John Peel sessions, getting the signatures, G George Martin. That signature for the venue was actually what ended up with Riverside. So Riverside, the venue, was came, came out of that. Came out of that. Yes. And a lot of hard work, and much more yeah. hard work, I need to say, from other people. But that was the very start of getting a bit of um, you know an organised group yeah. of people together to try to push the council to release some funding to get a venue for young people and we were just as I say a very small part of that and other people took it on to much you know to, to actually achieve it but that was our bit at the very start to get the signatures to, to generate a bit of interest um, obviously we were 
sidetracked into doing much more of our own stuff before before Riverside uh, opened. But we played the played Riverside a few times. Um, filmed a tube bit there, and then we also got on the works program, TX forty five. Um, and I mean, we tended to do gigs around around here. We did a lot of kind of benefit gigs. I remember doing a gig down Walls End, East End Club for South African trade unionists when the apartheid mm. regime was yeah. at its height. You know, things like that. So, and it was a political time as well. You know, Thatcherism yeah. and everything. So it was kind of which side are you on? I was very much on the kind of left of centre mm-hmm. of things. We actually played the the Red Wedge tour gig at Riverside as well. There's some video footage of that, which is on YouTube. Yeah. And, and, and this is an interesting point of historical fact I want to correct. The book on Riverside, there's a book on Riverside, right. and it's got Elvis Costello playing at that Red Wedge gig, and he's using our guitarist, George's guitar, not Quinn the Eskimo's guitar, because it actually credits the picture saying Elvis Costello using Quinn the Eskimo's guitar. It's not. It's George Scullion's guitar. We were in the dressing room at the time, and he was brought across from Tang T studio because... The communards and Billy Bragg and that were late getting there. Elvis Costello wasn't supposed to play, um, and but the place was packed. It was absolutely rammed, and we were due to go on. And lo and behold, who turns up but Elvis Costello from the Tube Studios? Um, come on, then. What do you want me to do? I'll I'll get up there. Has anybody got a guitar and borrow? Fender Telecaster. That'll do nicely. The white one. And away he goes, and we had to go on after him. So imagine that. Imagine us following Elvis Costello.
to see. It was it was a would, brilliant day. But, yeah, but um, with it being local, surely you had a really receptive crowd. Um, well, receptive crowds in no. those days. You know what you know what people are like. Even crowds in those well. days. I mean, we were chatting before. I heard the Gary Chapman interview, and and um, I was at the gig at um, New Time Theatre when the Fall Cabaret Voltaire Flesh. My boy Lollipop, and, and and I couldn't remember the name of Gary's band, but then I was, I've actually still got the ticket in the house. It clicks, I think it's got rhythm tick, clicks. Rhythm clicks, right? It's just got clicks on the ticket, and I remember he got such a hard time, you know, from some sections of the audience because he let penetration at that time, and we had gigs where you, people would be, you know, for whatever reason they don't even give you a chance sometimes. Um, sorry, the, the Riverside thing was fine, but it's almost like you're saying with a crowd on their feet stamping and clapping and cheering. Not really, but we got a reasonably warm reception and the place was rammed. It was a great thing for us to do. Um, but as I say, I, I really, I just, I might sound a bit petty about it, but I just think, I feel sometimes as if Darkness and Jab have been written out of mm -hmm. this town's history, this musical history of the North East. And... We are one of the only bands that ever got any John Peel sessions. We had some indie singles. I'm very proud of what we did on our own, you know, through our own efforts. Um, yeah, with the punk spirit, if you want to call yeah. it that. Yeah. But as a teenage kid, you know, getting involved in music and trying to make something happen, trying to do something with your life. Um, and it's because we weren't connected. We weren't one of the cool gang. We were outsiders, really. Who was kid, the cool gang? Well, I think the, the lads from the town, you know, you had to, I mean, there was, actually, to be fair, there was a couple of, a couple of the guys who were really the, the kind of, you know, people like Steve Oliver from Zap and all that, who are lovely, absolutely lovely, brilliant with us. I mean, Steve used to do the sound for us, but some of the kind of hangers-on of that crowd, it was almost like if you were, you know, um, not one of them, then it was almost as if, like, you weren't important, whereas, to me... Everybody's got. If you've got something to say, then fine. Mm -hmm. Just you might not everybody might like it. Yeah. But at least give people a chance, you know. And we played a gig, early gig, in the junction, and that's where I met the guys from Cancino, who are lovely lads, Pete and you know um, Jeff and Richie, really really nice blokes who we still keep in touch with now. Um, and there was a few other people there, and you know. That was a really good gig for us because we were the bottom of the bill, just added at the last minute. And it was, I just think everybody was just sitting there with open mouths because I just think they were, who the hell are these? <laughs> and that felt great mm -hmm. because like we were a bit younger as well than, than most of the, you know, the, the kind of bands that were around the town at the time. Um, and I do think people actually were just sitting there thinking, bloody hell, this is something which is a bit different, completely in your face. Mm -hmm. Like, you know... I use the word aggressive, but not in a kind of physical sense, musically loud, you know, the, the riffs that we played, the vocal sounds and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I think, I think, you know, it was, it was a, it was a good time, but you didn't get this, you didn't get a big sense of communal support, yeah. which I think is a shame. I think some bands were good with each other, quite pally, good mates and other bands weren't. Do you was, think that's what filled the North East in creating a long-standing scene as such because nobody ever talks about a Newcastle scene really no. we, we desperately sort of look back and try to cling on to a few groups but as a scene you, you yeah. really can never compare with the likes of Manchester, Liverpool, Bristol yeah. and do you think people's attitudes were responsible for that? Possibly. Towards each other. I think I think that, that maybe that will be one of the factors. Yes, I would agree that's one of the factors. I think the the other thing is maybe a lack of a venue until maybe Riverside came along because there was nowhere. Um, you know, it was like in London. Um, you know, you'd get and in Belfast. You know, I've seen before we talked mm. to Steve. You know, the Harp Bar. You'd have maybe some bars where it, that's it. You can pub scene where you get these. You know, in you get the hundred club or whatever in yeah. London, the Roxy. I mean that that was a really significant um, album for me when I was growing up live at the Roxy. You know, like Buzzcocks, Wire, and Polystyrene, and you know Slaughter and the Dogs on that kind of live album. Um, I think that they created their own scene, didn't they? And the yeah. venue would have lots of bands on and give people a chance, and, just, and so people would go to the venue to watch whoever was on irrespective of who they were, what they did. They just mm -hmm. provided the platform for people to get up. And I think that that wasn't in Newcastle at that time. I think Riverside 
could have been like that, but became very clicky. Yeah. I think Riverside was extremely clicky, um, which is a shame. Um, you know, some nice people there who, have, who I know who work there. Um, I guess it's just one of those things. Voltaire then, so you know you'd get headlining bands who play all over the country would come to Riverside because it was a big venue. I think maybe that was part of the problem there. It was too big for the smaller stuff to be sustainable mm -hmm. as a as a paying you know venture. So I think there was a, a few different different things and maybe lack of vision. You had people like Keith Armstrong, Kitchenware, who did actually have um, a, a great deal of success with bands like the Kane Gang. Um, prefab Sprout, um, the Dandies, you know, um, and we tried, I'll be honest about it, we tried to sort of see if they would take an interest in us, but um, I just don't think we fit into their model. We were too rough, too aggressive, too kind of punky. Image was all wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, as I said before, quite a few years had passed from the early days of punk to when we were playing in 81. 
81, 82, 83 and, and beyond, and dressed all in leather, mm-hmm. black mirror shades, looked quite hostile, even though I'm such a lovely person. <laughs> but, but, but you know what I mean? It's, it's a kind of band to, look. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people didn't look like exactly. a band. Yeah. That looked like a band. Yeah, you know? we, we had an image. We mm-hmm. had a, a, an image that we wanted to portray. And some of that is, is believe it or not, I'm quite a sh- I was, I'm not so much now, I was quite a shy person as a teenage boy, you know, yeah. you know, and all that kind of internal turmoil that you have, which came out in the songs in, a, in quite an aggressive way, that's because I was shy and mm. not secure. Yeah. So it kind of comes out as, a, as, as an aggressive stance because you're, it's a defensive thing. Yeah. If you are more confident and more easygoing, you, you wouldn't behave in that way. Yeah. And I think that was misinterpreted by people and it's only when you get older that you can look back and see that that's you know fairly obvious where that was all coming from um, but we just didn't fit with the much more melodic tuneful poppier more commercial um, kitchenware sound you know yeah I mean I said before but I still find that surprising because the the are elements of your songs which it's maybe it's just in retrospect but looking back now they do actually fit that kitchenware you know, you have a real soft side oh, to Darkness do. and Jive. Yeah, and do. I was going to ask you about that. I mean, was that like a conscious decision? Because if you listen to the two John Peel sessions, like you said before, very raw, mm-hmm. very energetic, sort of angry at times. Yeah. And although some of that still remained um, to the latter days, a lot of it really did sort of soften. It um, did, it did, Mel. You're right. The reasons yeah. for that. Um, oh, I, I think if I, I try, to, try to answer that question in terms of the songs, um, if I, the, the John Peel sessions, the two of them, really represent the early set. It's almost like that would have been what our first album, if we'd have been able to record an album in a studio, it would have probably looked like, you know, it might have been a few, a few different things on there as well, but generally that would be the same thing. Um, and we just developed, I think, but the themes of the songs, I mean, we did, one of the first songs we had which I really regret never recording was a song called Music is Sex is Pain. And that and that was like, you know, just that kind of summarised almost like what the early stuff was about, you know, mm. the sex, anger, vulnerability, you know, whatever it might be. And more, I, I like to try to get under the skin of things. Yeah. And, that, and, you know, as I said before about the couple of singles that we did, which I think the lyrics just were never... Um, kind of appreciated by anybody at the time and that the candle is about religion um, you know about I'm an atheist I don't believe in God but I was brought up in quite a religious family mm. um, so it's a rebellion against that so that there's a theme of religion there's the theme of being entrapped wanting to us come, come from a fairly you know poor working class background you know my dad worked in the shipyards and worked hard all his life um, and but we didn't have that much money so he kind of, you know, wanted to escape from that kind of poor background of rage in a cage, you know, I want to get out of here, all that kind of stuff. Um, speak Clearly is about random violence. The way I grew up, I don't know about you, but when you were no, a lad, seriously. You, yeah. you had gang, you know, if you're straight outside of your territory, you'd get, and that was just your normality. Yeah. And, and then, you know, not like today where you've got knife crime and everything, it was much, much gentler than that. But it was still there, ever present, every day, random violence in your life. Mm-hmm. Domestic violence, I've already explained about victims so there were themes that I tried to deal with and themes went on into kind of politics I think in the second album like oppression is anti-Thatcherite it's you know all that kind of stuff Um, spirit is waking is anti-apartheid shakedown is anti-consumerism about like greed is good there's no such thing as society which is what Thatcher said which I think is an absolutely disgusting disgraceful thing to say and so you had songs like that on that album and then you get like um, Innocence, which was written by me for the birth of my first child. So what was happening in my life at the time? So there's a reflection of things in society, but there's also this kind of inner reflection of what's happening in my own life. And Seduction is is very much a a love song about, Mm. you know, obviously kind of two people being together. You're just getting kind of, you know, married and all that kind of stuff and having a baby. So uh, and and you want to try to express how you feel about that. So it and it is a bit of a contradiction. Uh, I, so we weren't very good 
at slotting into a particular genre to make it easy for mm. people to pick up a record and put on like Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. Yeah. You know, you're going to get some really good rock and roll. The Sex Pistols, the Clash. You're going to get you're going to get that guitar, raunchy guitar, and solid bass yeah. and drums. We had a mixture, and I think that wasn't easy for people to I, because you might love one song and absolutely mm -hmm. hate another one, and I think we we suffered from that. I mean, that's what I was going to say because. I understand exactly where you're coming from because certain topics can only be dealt with with a certain tone and like yeah. you're saying a, a more personal thing mm -hmm. certainly the birth of a child yeah you know it's got to be soft hasn't it and well I mean I wrote I wrote that for her from my little girl you know when she was a baby you know don't lose your innocence mm -hmm. and it and I'm very proud of that so that's I suppose if I can step back from the darkness and jive as a band Behind the band is a person, mm -hmm. and that person has feelings, yeah. and that's me. So, like as a writer, you try to write about what you feel about, whether you feel happy, sad, angry, bitter, twisted. Faith fairly recently, which was with the lads from Zombie Punk Squad, with a couple of other pals in, and yeah. and that is a very much more personal album to me. But again, talking about the emotional side of stuff, there's a track on there called um, "Let Me Go," which is about me mum who had Alzheimer's and was in a home for eight years and died just about eighteen months ago. Um, and that's about me having to put her into the home. And there's a line in there, you know, like. Uh, she screams in my face, I just want to run. And, and a lot of the stuff that I write about, um, it's not always absolutely totally true in every single facet of you know what the lyric might say, but I do try to capture some real emotions about mm -hmm. stuff. And there's a, there's a lot of song, a lot of stuff on that album where you know what you're saying before about it started to get a bit more mellow and and even though there's a gap of God knows how many years between the Dogs and Jive stuff and that um, set of songs, some of those songs are quite old. So there is actually 
probably a progression between the end of Darkness and Jive and the stuff that's actually on that album. Even though there's a big gap in time, it is, um, you know, there's stuff on there which is, you know, about love songs and stuff about your own life, but also getting older. And there's a song on there about me, my daughter, you know, um, having a boyfriend, and that's called Love Away. And that is a really kind of punky song because what I was trying to capture there was how I felt as a teenage boy but actually being a father trying to talk to his teenage daughter. And so I, I actually used the punk music, which was my music as a teenager, to try to get a message through to my daughter to say, I know that you're going to embark upon all this kind of sexual activity and all that yeah. kind of thing. It's kind of okay, but, you know, like, I'm having to give away, my, you're not my baby anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's a song from a father to a daughter. Yeah. Um, and then there's a song from me as a son to a mother and you know, there's a lot of really personal stuff on that album. And the point I'm trying to make here is, is that the song, the, what I try to write is stuff which I think is meaningful to me, it might not be meaningful to everybody, but as a writer, I think that's why some of the songs on the albums might not sit together because it's, it's, it's me trying to express a particular thing where the song is more important than the image of the band or the kind of sound of you know, what we're doing at a particular time. I think the song comes first.
sure you supported some major yes name. yes we did um we actually probably if we start with you know the um we support 74 gold steve from belfast um purely coincidentally we got a chance to support stiff little fingers at the city hall in maybe 1983 maybe and steve actually knows you know some of the lads in stiff little fingers which is purely coincidental we didn't get a gig through him um, and we support stiff little fingers at the city hall and you're saying like about us at our height i think um, and that was a great i mean the fact that i can sit here in a band that never really did an awful lot in terms of chart success or record sales so actually my band our band has been on the stage at the city hall where t-rex played my first ever con you know led zeppelin have played david bowie iggy pop the damned i mean i saw t-rex in 77 yeah, the damned that. supported um, you know, T Rex. That was a great gig to see see the damned as well as you know as well as T Rex playing, and we actually played on that stage. But I have to say, and this is funny, and I kind of I can look back with this and laugh. I think the biggest cheer we got um, was at the end when I said that this is the last song. <laughs> it was like, Yay! you know. So you kind of think, but you know what it's like. I mean, I've been to the city hall where people have got booed off before. John Cooper <laughs> Clark got booed off, and John Cooper Clark's brilliant. You know what I mean? So I'm sitting there. He's a there. legend now. He's, exactly. I went to see him not that long ago and he's still fantastic. He's a bit slower than he was, but his, his mind is brilliant. He's a genius. He's funny, clever, you know. And and I just think if people can sit in an audience and boo somebody like John Cooper mm -hmm. Clark, then what the hell chances some kind of, you know, scallywag like me got? And you've got to not let that kind of stuff get there. Yeah. And to be fair to the audience, the Stiff Little Fingers audience, they were pretty tolerant of us at the time. And, you know, the set that we were playing was pretty much the John Peel session set. So it was, some of it was a bit in your face. And it wasn't it wasn't your two-minute punk anthem type stuff. You mm -hmm. know, it was, it, was, it was a bit of a broad mix. Other gigs, um, we support the Rizzillos um, up at one of the um, halls of residence. And... Um, and I'm sure this is not the Rizzolo's fault, but my 60 watt Carlsborough amp got nicked that night, um, never to be seen again. So I don't, and I've got tickets to see them at the Clooney, so I'll be going down just to uh -huh. check out the back lane to see whether they've got, uh, you know. But sorry, I'm not making any accusations, it's just a fact, it just went missing, I don't know who's got it. Um, and that was, a, that was a really good gig. And another one we did up at the Halls of Residence was um, supporting French and Saunders and the Oblivion Boys, which was a comic strip tour. And I've actually, I'm pleased to say, I've actually still got a poster of that um, in the house. So it's nice to sort of have, you know, it's got French and Saunders, Darkness and Jive. It's actually got by popular request, Darkness and Jive. Which is, and I think there was a bit of a groundswell of support for us. In, I mean, we, we, we got invited to go up to play in the Borders, um, in Gala Shields and stuff like that. You know, played down in York, played down the Marquee in London. Supported the Lotus Eaters down in London. So we did a few significant gigs but I do I think I said before really regret the fact we never went on tour I wish I wish I had some funny tour stories or you know mm, yeah. uh, interesting tour stories to tell but I haven't you know and, it, and that's a shame because because I think we would have been much better known more well respected if we'd been able to play the stuff that we were doing to a wider audience there would have been people there would have been a handful of people in all of those towns that would have got it they would have understood what we were trying to do mm. and I just don't think we got the exposure which is a shame but you know that's life it is but I think these days there's a thing called retro mania yeah so people are very much interested in looking back yeah that's true so for me personally I think darkness and jive are still very much alive and hopefully through programs such as this people that haven't heard of you Yep. Or maybe he's heard of you first time around and didn't appreciate it. Yeah. Might listen. Yeah. Well, that's very kind of you to say so, Trevor. And I, I do appreciate you giving me the chance to tell a bit of the story because I do think that we have been written out of mm -hmm. almost the history of the music of this e era. Yeah. And as I said, you know, that illustration of the, the picture in the Riverside book is, is just an example of that. Yeah. It's just like, you know, how can that possibly happen? It's because somebody has said something which has then been written down and now it's all of a sudden in a book mm -hmm. and people read books and they think that's the truth yeah. and that's not the truth yeah. and I think that that's a very powerful thing in terms of you know just telling your own story I mean something like this is is, is quite therapeutic for me because you know you can think back over the stuff and yeah there are 
um, frustrations, but there are also really some great memories, very happy times, and lots of great people who we met along the way, you know. And I do feel that at least we tried to do it our way, and we did it uh, in a way which was which we didn't sell out to anybody, and we were authentic in what we were trying to do. Um, and even though the records didn't sell and we didn't make loads of money, I'm still very proud of what we did. Paul okay. Johnston, Darkness and Jive, thanks very much for being with us this morning. It's been a pleasure, thank you. I mean, you're talking about being vain, but it, it's not about that. It's, it's about you're a serious songwriter. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're obviously, on one part, you'll not be completely happy that you didn't achieve what you set out to achieve. No, that's true. I mean, uh, you could couch it in other terms and say, oh, you've failed, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, if what you're trying to get at is how did that make you feel? I, I did, I was very upset and very bitter and very twisted. I kind of used that, those words, bitter and twisted in a jokey sense. But I mean, I was psychologically kind of hurt, depressed, you know, when, when, the, when the band stopped. And I didn't play, apart from a couple of little support gigs, um, here and there, playing, you know, alongside me, it's another, for about 10 years. And, that's, and, and that is a big loss in your life. But it, it got to the point where I thought, who am I doing this for and why am I doing it? But the music now is purely 100% about the music. And that is quite liberating because you don't have to worry about whether anybody likes it or not. Yeah. If you've got the chance to do it for yourself and thankfully I've got a couple of mates who will help me you know make that idea become a reality so I've got to you know strum away with me guitar Tony on the drums Terry on the bass the guy who played um, cello on the album that I did Artie absolutely brilliant musician and um, Dave Moan who is a pal who's got a studio up with Fenham can record the songs in and it's just a very positive enjoyable um, you know very rewarding thing to do to actually just think if I hadn't done this this song wouldn't exist and it's the act of creativity that is its own reward it's not about the money it's actually about just creating something unique that, that and I, I get a lot of a, I still get a, a real buzz from that Thank you.